W7CAM to teach us about ham radio. Thanks a lot. So, like I said, it's amateur radio. I was informed that this group would be interested. Um, those who don't know me, I'm a grad student over at the university. I play with medical physics. It's cool. Uh, so I'm not an infosex guy. <laughs> Hopefully I hit enough that's interesting to you and makes you want to get your ham radio license. Uh, at the end, I'll give the dates for the next ham radio exam. You do have to take the exam to get the license, and if you don't have a license, it's about a $15,000 fine if you're caught. So you probably want to take the exam, which is like 1% of 1% the cost of the, the uh, fine. So what is, so getting into it, what is amateur radio? Two-way communications. You actually have to talk to someone. So this isn't like broadcast. This is more like the walkie-talkies you played with, you know, being Dick Tracy when you were, you know, that tall. What do we do? How can this benefit you? So it's just kind of things that, in general, the amateur radio community gets into. A lot of us get into storm spotting, <coughs> emergency communications. So I got into it, went to storm spotter training, and saw a guy with a big handheld radio on his hip and started talking to him, and it spiraled because I'm a nerd and you know, <laughs> nerd stuff. Um, so we do a lot of storm spotting. We have weather nets. Noah listens to us. Um, last year, I can actually claim one of the tornado warnings with the sirens as mine. Um, I saw the ground. I could, I could actually make a call. And you know, we run nets. It's hunkered down in their basement, taking uh, reports from all of us. National Weather Service Davenport swings their large antenna over to listen to our repeater, and they get their if there's reports, they fire off the tornado warnings. Speaking of storm star training, it's tomorrow, if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kirkwood Regional Center, it's that big building kind of up on top of the hill near the water tower. Um, it's got a big, big radio antenna near it. Uh, up on Oakdale, 6.30 p.m. Technically, all those tickets are gone, but I've never seen them kick someone out. They'll take all the storm spotters they can get. So other things we do, we get into what's called DX or contesting. Uh, this is long distance communications. So for some guys, it's build the big $15,000 antenna. Some guys, it's you know, go to Lowe's, buy a few copper pipes, tune it up nicely, and make it work. And I will tell you, 10 feet of cheap 14 gauge and five watts will get you to Japan without internet without repeaters without any infrastructure whatsoever just you the wire and the reflective ionosphere um, so there are contests that, that are held the AWRL American Radio Relay League hosts contests monthly and there's dozens of other groups so any given weekend there's something going on you can get on see how many other contacts you can make it's a lot of fun in June, there's field day where all the ham radio guys build all the crazy antennas they can in 24 hours and make all the contacts they can in the same 24 hours. A lot of fun. We also do a lot of home brewing. So if you want to you know, build a simple antenna, you know, that's cheap wood and welding wire from Lowe's, or if you want to you know, go ahead and build your own radio or you know, Raspberry Pis are now being used for ham radio. Uh, you can actually transmit radio directly from the uh, GPIO pins. I don't recommend it, it's kind of noisy. It has its uses though. Uh, you can also receive. Um, you can use the Pi or use uh, laptops, desktops with these small software defined radios, you know, 15, 20 bucks. Pulls mm -hmm. down all the data, all the uh, RF. Just hook it up to any old antenna that you can find. It's a lot of fun. Bring down FM, AM, CB, ham bands. Folks listen to the trunked systems. Some guys even use it for radio astronomy. Um, with an InfoSec, you might use it for uh, creating a replay attack on a Jeep Cherokee, for instance. If you remember that from a few years ago. The hardware was not dissimilar to this. $15, take over a car. Um, what else do we do? 
So we can get radio direction finding, fox hunts, as they're affectionately called. Say you've got a pirate broadcaster, you get a couple guys out there with directional antennas, have them report their locations, their angles, draw a triangle. You've got the location of the uh, uh, spurious signals. This can also just be a lot of fun. Folks will intentionally build a little pie or something that transmits, you know, half a micro watt or something, and they'll hide it somewhere horrible, like under a bridge, and it'll bounce all over Kingdom Come, and you know, you have to go find it, and it's a okay. game. We also do satellite operations. So this is an actual ham satellite that is in orbit right now. Actually, I think it's decayed out of orbit and burnt up, but um, these get launched fairly regularly now, especially with the commercial uh, launches that are going up. About ten to fifteen thousand dollars to launch one. So groups will get together. The universities put quite a few of these up for science, not for ham, unfortunately. Um, <coughs> Also, the we'll talk to the International Space Station when they're uh, when they're available. We can talk to them digitally. Uh, there's an X25 Digipeter on there. Uh, they also broadcast TV. That is a uh, example of one of the frames of the TV that they broadcast. And occasionally, when they feel like it, they will get on and chat with people. Uh, it's one of those rites of passage to talk to the International Space Station, or before that, the space shuttles. We also do event support. So apparently I got visited by the pixelation gods. Um, <laughs> so events, this is the Nebraska State track meet, uh, high school track meet. We pushed data around for them so that they didn't have to buy and build their own networks. And it's a nice excuse to go out and spend a couple days in the sun. <laughs> uh, some of us get radio restoration. That's one of my projects right now, Korean War radio. Um, I don't think it actually saw service, but um, again, pixelation. That's actually the radio set setup used on a uh, Navy carrier during World War II. Not mine. One of these years. Um, Restore them. They're still legal to use on air, as long as they're tuned well and they meet FCC requirements of you know, spurious emissions. So you're not you know accidentally broadcasting, both in military and the ham bands. So that can happen. We've got a couple, couple areas we share with the military. So kind of the latest and greatest things: digital radio. This is where commercial has kind of eclipsed us, and now we're trying to catch up with them uh, using actual uh, digital hardware to run our radio systems or to be the entire radio system. Uh, so we've got these software defined radios now where all the processing is done digitally and it's just converted to analog real quick at the end. Or we can take it in and uh, do all of our demodulation via software. So what is all this so what would actually getting a ham radio license get for you? So here's what you've got right now. As you, you know, as you sit here, here's what you can legally play with. You're governed by FCC Part 15 rules. Um, one part of that is you're allowed to transmit a little bit in the FM broadcast band at 0 0.01 microwatts. If you're lucky, that'll get across the tape. Um, and some of the numbers don't really improve in more interesting bands like the 440 band or the 900 ISM bands. You get about five microwatts. With your base class te tech license, there's three <coughs> levels, tech, general, amateur, extra. Your tech license, you get access to all of these different bands. So 1.2 gig, 900, 440, two meters, or 220, two meters, and then a bunch of HF frequencies, these propagate around the world. <clears throat> and you can put out 1,500 watts, 10 to the ninth stronger signal. <clears throat> so that being said, you can hit Japan on 5 to 10 watts. So you probably don't need all 1,500. <laughs> you can then also upgrade to the general class license. Uh, that gives you access to almost everything that's allocated to the US amateurs. There's a few small exceptions, like 
when you're in the 20 meter band or <coughs> where you just have to get the next extra level license. The extra level is kind of like a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Um, but it also gets you voice on HF. If you have your tech, you can only do Morse code, which you can run with a computer. Morse code is no longer part of the exam. That was taken off in 1997. So you don't have to learn code. You just have to learn etiquette and learn physics, which both are fun. So some of the things we're doing here in the Midwest with amateur radio right now, um, large group of folks are pushing the digital radio on the amateur bands. And it comes in three varieties. There's digital audio. So this would be DMR, you know, your standard trunk networks or whatnot. There's also digital data, which I'll cover a little bit. <coughs> so right now, digital audio, things like DMR, which is an open source standard, and Motorola turned it into Moto Turbo. D-Star, which is ICOM's, ICOM's child, and Fusion, which is Yezu's product. Uh, a lot of it's being used for emergency communications, so you can communicate between cities and between the states uh, clearly. It also allows us to do DX for the cheap. In HF rig, if you don't build it yourself and you want a little bit of power and some features, it could be three, $400. This radio, with this Pi, will get you to anywhere in the world for about 100, 120 bucks. And that's because digital, you can now connect it into the internet. We've finally caught up to VoIP. <laughs> uh, so normally in ham radio, we have these repeaters, which in the pictures, you'll see it drawn on top of a mountain. Around here, we substitute a large tower. Um, people talk into that, it broadcasts back out so that I can use one of these instead of a big you know, car mount or home mount system. But then someone got the idea to actually take those repeaters and link them to the internet. Also, you can take these now. This will take in the signal, just like a repeater will, and push it to the internet. The upside of this is I work in a basement 40 feet underground. I can now do ham radio at my desk. <laughs> so, and clear, clear audio. You know, digital with all of the error correction methods, it's nice and clean. So, in that scenario, can you get any repeater below? Yes, any repeater that is linked on that system. Yep. Yep. These are all the DMR users in the state. Right now, um, because your FCC license, your address is on the internet. No, there is no way to opt out of that. Um, so, folks like me can go to you. Yeah, you can't get a PO box and cover yourself. Um, so, the state emergency communications group decided, hey, we need a map to figure out where all of our DMR users are so that Des Moines can call Waterloo if Waterloo's flooding or something. <coughs> and we've got quite a few. Des Moines got like 160 some users. We've got about 50 some here in Iowa City. <coughs> I got the bright idea to also map it by watershed. So, <laughs> so if we see Waterloo flooding, they know who to call. Or you know, somewhere up there, well, should they call, should this person be calling Des Moines or Omaha? The answer is Omaha. So, a lot of interesting things going on there. Aside from digital audio, we've got digital digital, digital data, digital pictures, whatever you want to call it. There's a few different ways of doing this. The old school, first one that was developed and commonly used was APRS, Automatic Position Reporting system or if you like actually going with the guy who wrote it, automatic packet reporting system. It's X25 over the over the airwaves. People build it into their little handhelds or they buy it bought in, built in, and they can transmit their location. Upshot is some folks put these little micro trackers on their car, they can watch their car drive around as they drive around inside of it. Or as was originally intended one of these things would be put on a repeater and would broadcast ham radio club meeting at such and such a time. Be there, you know, 
b0 or b squared. Um, fairly easy to accomplish. You get one of these terminal node controllers, which is just a glorified sound card. You can literally use the sound card out on your computer to control this. Plug it into your radio. Moving up from that is this program called FL Digi, which has most of the digital encoding schemes that you use in RF communications built into it. Type in a message, pick your mode, plug it into your computer, hit send. It's a lot of fun. A lot of folks are using that now for worldwide communications. It's a little bit more robust to ionospheric noise. A little bit easier to understand sometimes than voice communications. It can also be a lot more frustrating, but a lot more fun when you get a work in it. And then there's software defined radio. So, again, the, there's these little RTL SDR chips. Um, these are old DVB tuners that were repurposed. Um, they can go all the way from those up to the USRPs and the HackRFs that I know are common at the cons now. A uh, lot, lot of different uses, you know, device hacking, reverse engineering, again, replay attacks, you know, basically whatever you can think of there. Scanners, including trunks, uh, passive radar, if you're interested in building your own radar. Uh, satellite tracking, you can, you can actually legally drag all the data down from the NOAA satellites yourself. So set up an antenna, drag it down yourself. Reconstruct the images. Um, and then there's radio astronomy. So this is actually a picture of the radio coming off of Jupiter. So it emits on two main frequencies. A lot of these extras are hash that the uh, developer didn't clean up. It's probably USB. So, and you can track planes too. So a lot of fun there. What does it take to get a license? So. Like I said, three levels of licensing. There's tech, general, and the extra. Each one, the tech and the general are each 35 multiple choice questions. The entire question pool is online with answers. FCC put it there. So your tech license, you can literally just go download it, run it like flashcards. It's the way I did it. The general and the extra, I recommend actually taking the time to learn it. Because this one, the idea is to just get you on the air. The general and the extra, it's about really getting in there and learning ham radio. You come, come to a licensing exam, you take your take the exam, it's pretty painless, gets graded on the spot, you know whether or not you passed. If you didn't, they do give you another chance, one more. It's another 15 if you retake it. If you pass this, <coughs> they will automatically hand you the general exam. I recommend just trying it, even if you haven't studied for it. Gives you a flavor, it's free. So the other, you know, one of the other parts, is there anyone interested in a ham radio class? I do single day classes where it's a nine to five, everything you ever needed to know to take the exam. It's a grueling day. <laughs> um, uh, usually lunch is on your own. <laughs> but I do it here, so you couldn't, or down at the, the U, so you could actually walk up and get pizza or whatever you want. March 24th, which would be this Saturday or the following Saturday. If you're interested, yeah. cool. Is Should we put something on Slack or something? Yeah, we, get, we can do a poll on Slack or something. Cool. 31st. 31st, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, which day? The 31st. 24th or the 31st. Okay. Yep, they're the next two Saturdays. Correct. The first is Easter, yeah. First is yeah. Easter. Yeah, yeah, yep, you're right. The next licensing exam, which is the date is out of my hands on this one, is April 9th. 309 Van Allen Hall, which is two buildings, three buildings that way. Uh, starts at 8, 1800, 6 p.m. Usually runs about three hours. You show up somewhere in those three hours. It should take you about 15 minutes to take the exam and get out the door. So anytime in there, the guys who graded are nice. A lot of fun. At this point, questions. You've mentioned the replay attacks a couple of times. Mm -hmm. For the initiate, uninitiated, uh, what are they? 
So say I've got my keys, which I don't have actually on me, the key fob from your car. I can actually take in, take one of these, press my key fob, record it, and then replay it on this and act, unlock my car with this instead of my key fob. The upshot is, or downshot, depending upon what your goals are in life, is you walk around a, <laughs> walk around a parking lot, you grab everyone's key fob, and then can open their car for some reason. It's an interesting security hypothetical more than anything truly useful. Um, other questions? So you mentioned there was an extra exam. Yes. Right. So I know that's like significantly more in depth, but what does that test look like? 50 multiple choice questions. And again, the entire question pool is online. So you could be, you, you could skip over the whole point of it and just study all the flashcards. And I've seen guys do it and they get their extra and, and usually they end up becoming really good hams. Um, it's nice, it's more fun to actually sit there and study. You get a lot more out of it. So is it a, it's a lifetime thing or is it? 10 years. Ten years. Okay. And to renew it, you just fill out the form. If you forget to fill it out after those 10 years, you've got two years before they give away your call sign. And do you, do you select your call sign? Or? They will initially auto-generate one. I was initially KD0OOB. And that's based on the region that you took the exam in. And at one time it used to, used to you know, if you moved, you had to get a new call sign. Now it's you, it stays with you until you get a vanity call sign. And yes, is there a cost on the van? Not anymore. It used to be fifteen dollars. <laughs> I'm not bitter at all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I got mine. Was, you, know, you can pick it then based on where you grew up or you know something meaningful to you. Any recommendations on where we can pick models up here in handheld radio? So this one, mm -hmm. Amazon. Okay. Um, Gigaparts also has them. Um, ham radio online, it's good. So two types. You know, this one does all digital, and then there's a whole another series that does all analog. It all depends on what you want to do. And you know, the, the analogs will start you about 25, 30 bucks, and will run up to however much you want to pay. <laughs> so you recommend somebody starts with analog first. Analog's easy. Um, it'll get you into the community, which is actually pretty important. Um, honestly, doing ham radio in isolation is not that much fun. And nice, you don't actually have to talk to them. You just have to be on the radio. It's not like you know we're all face to face here. If you like being in your basement, you can, you can stay there. So, um, yeah. yeah. If you're super shy and you don't actually like want to talk to people, like I. I hate speaking to people. Uh, you can, like you said, run uh, FL Digi earlier and literally just basically text messages over radio. Yeah. You can talk as far as you want and yeah, all over the world. Radio version. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Can you encrypt the communication? No. No. Um, that being said, anything that you do digital is functionally encrypted because, well, okay, for instance, here in town, the news stations have started listening to our storm nets and have actually started rebroadcasting those, which is, it's a gray area, borderline illegal, because we're not supposed to be broadcasting. So we're thinking going digital to prevent that. That being said, now everyone has to buy digital radio. We'll see if it happens. Functional encryption. It's not true encryption. And that, that's just FCC. 